Are we ready to start? Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome. Thanks for your patience. Uh, it's a Sophia Jacob Lecture Series, Season 2. Uh, we have an awesome program planned for you all tonight. Uh, we have three great presenters, Terrence Hannum, Carly Patak, and Twig Harper. So uh, before we get started, we always just like to mention that uh, there is a donation bowl in the front. Um, all of the artists that present for us present for free. So if anybody has anything to kick in, it would, we would give it right to the artists. Um, so let's just get started. First, we're going to have Terrence Hannum come up. He's an artist and musician based in Baltimore. Um, Terrence received, received his MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and he currently teaches at Stevenson University. Terrence works in a variety of media, including drawing, collage, publications, sculpture, and sound. He's exhibited and, and performed all over the states, as well as internationally. And uh, you all may have experienced his piece at Sophia Jacob in January in our group show, which was awesome. Um, so we're just really excited to have him here to present because we've always loved his work and he's been a really positive presence on the Baltimore scene ever since he's been here. So let's have Terrence come up. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, how's it going? Good. Um, I'm starting to get comfortable. So I, <clears throat> I had this idea for a topic, and something I've been obsessed with a lot lately. Um, and I'm we're looking here. This isn't my work. I wish it was. I wish I was this good of a collage uh, artist. But this is John Stezaker, this British uh, artist. I don't know if anybody knows him. Um, <clears throat> and John Stezaker is a really interesting guy. He's concerned uh, where an image kind of becomes autonomous. Um, and for him, it goes to this series of disjunctions, and he kind of cites Maurice Blanchot a lot about this idea that an image needs to go through this series of deaths to arrive at being visible again, um, and then to become disconnected from its previous reference. So that kind of has sat with me for a while. Um, and what we're going to talk about first tonight a little bit is about the lost profile, or the profile perdu, um, in French, right? Uh, I'm going to start kind of in film. I'm going to work kind of towards what I'm doing from these in disparate influences that I have. So um, this is a, a still from um, Gaspar Noe's Enter the Void. I don't know if anybody's seen it. But, um, uh, and what I think is really interesting is kind of where Oscar, the main character, passes away. Um, and then the, the film shifts, and suddenly we're watching the film um, from the back of the actor's head, right? Um, if anybody's seen it. This is a really interesting choice. Um, and uh, as he kind of floats over Tokyo in the final moments of his life, uh, the sequence of images um, come to us. And that's essentially how the film is established. And it's this very nonlinear, really interesting narrative. Um, time collapses in on itself. History and the present mingle. Um, we see death and birth all tinged with what uh, Gaspar Noe, he describes in this interview, that it's just the final, it's not like what could have been. It's just the final firings of Oscar, who was on DMT at the time, as he's dying and he remembers his friend who kind of sold him out in this drug deal, uh, mentions the Tibetan Book of the Dead and how it's structured. Um, so linearity gets done away with, scale shifts, perspective changes. Now, I've taught um, film before, and this was really interesting to me because um, this happens in Tarkovsky. I've taught classes on Tarkovsky, and uh, this is a really common device he uses if you're familiar with his films, as he like these like tracking shots, and suddenly the character that was facing you is now faced away from you. He dig the character disengages from the viewer, um, and so here we have like the mirror. It happens in Stalker. It happens in Solaris, which I'm, I'm going to come back to Solaris quite a bit actually. Uh, so these characters disengage. They ignore the lens. They turn away. They kind of turn normally towards a vista of nature um, or some kind of memory that happens off in the distance. And you're not exactly sure if it's it's like a flashback, but you were just kind of in the present, so it's really kind of confusing. But regardless, their face gets obscured. This becomes, it becomes really interesting. Um, I, saw, I think this kind of happens before, right? So Chris Marker's La Jete, it's not exactly a moving picture, right? It has like a series of still images. Um, and suddenly, I'm struck with asking, like, well, why is this happening? Where does this come from? Um, I mean, it's different from like, you know, like some like a hot, right? It's different from like the shot reverse shot, you know, which is really kind of like the normal way of conversations are filmed in kind of uh, cinema, right? It, it, you know, it embraces the back of the head to kind of continue this uh, linear narrative. Um, but then I think when we get to something like Lars von Trier's like Antichrist, right, it can combine horror, anonymity, and eroticism at the same time. And that to me 
It's really interesting. Um, so the Profile Purdue is actually established uh, in the time of the French Academy, although people are using it for hundreds of years beforehand. Um, and it's any time that the face is less um, than halfway in view, or turned away partially, or sometimes even completely. Um, so you see that in something like Boucher, right? Uh, you know, so like, you know, he's kind of the pornographer of the uh, Rococo era or whatever, right? Uh, Diderot claimed he was like prostituting his wife and all these images. It's really you know, salacious or whatever. This is totally not a salacious image, right? Um, but uh, this, this term gets coined and Boucher really capitalizes off of it. Um, and again, it kind of engages the erotic, right? Um, and, but before the Academy this happens, this is Bruegel's Hunters in the Snow, um, which also, if you're familiar with Solaris, this is the painting that's in the spaceship in Solaris that, that's above the planet, right? So uh, I don't, actually, I'm, st I'm still always trying to figure out why this is, but my, I, my question comes back to like, well, what does this do to the picture, right? So it kind, of, it kind of opens it up. This action takes place without us, like the audience is completely like secondary to the nature of the picture. Um, it doesn't need our engagement. Um, and the figures, they remain anonymous, again. This also happens, again, kind of in the Romantic era, right? This kind of totally sublime picture, right? So suddenly we're not, are we looking at the figures in the Caspar David Friedrich painting? Are we looking at the kind of epic sunset? Um, and this issue of the sublime comes, uh, is, is really influential for me in my work. It's something I always kind of look to. Um, so in many ways, it enhances the effects of the pictorial aspect of the picture plane, right? Because we're all supposed to look past and through or whatever, it's very bizarre. Um, and the last one, I think, is, is this idea of like defiance or obstinance. Um, so Magritte, you know, not to be reproduced. Um, and uh, I, I have a little aside, because the mirror is a really popular thing um, with the, this portrait. So kind of um, even before the Academy establishes what the profile Purdue is, uh, we have artists who start to manipulate it. But um, we have it like William Merritt Chase. We have it when photography comes around with Edward Steichen. Um, um, here we have like Nan Golden. Um, uh, you know, right, so it adds kind of this desire to know, even though it doesn't really show us that much more of the image, it kind of adds this other wound to the picture plane in some way. It's really interesting. Uh, famously, I was kind of thinking of like Eyes Without a Face by Friend Ju, it's this great film, um, where it's, actually, it's like a movie about losing, where the character loses her face, to have like her, another face stolen, added to her face that her then face I, rejects, right? So this like really interesting swapping of identities and what the face means, but there's all these great shots and uses of mirrors to kind of uh, one, because there's censorship or whatever, but two, it kind of tells the story in a more interesting way. And again, we return back to Solaris, right? This is a, a, a really important film for me. But um, so again, the, the memory that gets reincarnated by the planet, uh, if you haven't seen the movie, this probably sounds like really, really crazy. But um, <coughs> the Kelvin, the doctor, shows the replicant memory of his wife um, uh, that she's not real and she kills herself only to be reincarnated again. He has to kind of like keep proving to her and the mirrors kind of act as this interesting uh, device and again she gets to turn away and you're kind of stuck with the back of her head um, which is really haunting in a way. Um, but before all of that we have the uh, Venus at her mirror, so it's like Velazquez and we have like Peter Paul Rubens and Tin Toretto and again the mirror solves the identity crisis. It kind of like completes the whole, it displaces the front of the face into this other place. It's really abstract, kind of interesting. Um, so uh, for me, the Profile Purdue begins, or the Lost Profile, it establishes, um, you know, death, eroticism, anonymity, sublimity, um, and defiance in the end. Um, and that's kind of where I'm going to kind of transition into uh, my own work. Um, so defiance is a place that I uh, probably got the most interest in this form from. Because um, before I started dealing with the Lost Profile, the Profile Purdue, um, I was making work about the nexus between music and ritual and these really important things that would happen specifically around like underground music subcultures. Um, and I think um, at some point for a subculture to exist or kind of like stake their claim, it has to, has to make some certain decisions about what is not included um, as part of that subculture. And it has to turn its back in some way about um, how it defines itself. And that was always interesting to me. I'm a student of anthropology, so kind of how different like groups and subgroups define themselves and set the parameters, even when they think they aren't making parameters, uh, it, it really is interesting because then they do make parameters and they do make like, these are the rules, this is the gate, this is, yes, this is, you know, 
true black metal. Yes, this, you know, or whatever it is, right? This is the truth. This is not. Uh, that record is in. That record isn't. This concert is. That concert is not. Uh, this artist is. Then they went astray. Or, you know, I think it happens in every subculture. And that's really interesting to me. And I kind of spend a lot of time um, uh, with that. Uh, so again, this kind of turning the back is really interesting. And I think that it's it, because it's kind of brought on um, by the self that makes it um, uh, really important. So uh, one thing that captured my interest with this and kind of started this process and kind of made me start thinking about how I had seen all these images in film and in painting was going to like a concert um, and kind of the annoying way that you have to kind of look through all these heads. Like I'm a short guy and if you get there a little bit late, you can't get up to the front. So you have to look through like all these heads, through the backs of the heads to kind of this, this center that you're trying to ascertain like what's happening and who's doing what. Um, and you can miss a whole thing, right? Um, so I did this exhibition called the Midstar Throng, um, and it was a series of oil paintings um, based off a video um, that dealt with uh, kind of witnessing uh, these concerts and trying to, again, trying to like enter this dialogue of, um, you know, like with painting, I guess. And I was thinking a lot of like what I had said earlier with Caspar David Friedrich, like how you're kind of pushed to look beyond, but there's really not much there in the beyond of, of the painting, right? Even with the sunset, there's not much there. It's just color and, and oil moved around or something. Um, so, so for me, it's this, this way, like I was thinking about how if you go to a museum and it's like really crowded and you have to like look through people to kind of like look at the painting or something. Um, I kind of was thinking about how that, that's like the only place I could think of that did I recognize this motion from you're kind of like bobbing through, weaving your gaze to try and like grab like, well, what is that painting in the center there? Um, or sculpture or whatever. Uh, so that was kind of the only place I could think of it. So, so these are, this was a series that was done um, and then um, there was a video piece that was done. Can we turn that up a little bit? Thank you. me. I don't think it likes me today. Um, we had to do a little bit of configuring with this piece, but anyway, I'll just describe the video over the din of sirens. <laughs> um, uh, the video shows, um, you can kind of actually see it, but the audio is, is cut from it, but um, I shot this one concert and I got really fascinated with the, I couldn't see the band, so I just focused on the audience and there was this woman who was like headbanging the whole time. It was really quite beautiful. I thought it was just kind of this really interesting choreography. So I started um, focusing on that. That should say veils, kind of cut off. Um, as I um, moved on through this project and started thinking about that the headbanger as this kind of isolated figure was really interesting because before it was maybe more about the group and this kind of group audience participation experience where you're trying to like figure out what's happening in this concert. Um, so I decided, decided to kind of like pull back and focus on um, the single figure. Um, this also culminated in an exhibition that was uh, drawings and collages um, last fall. Um, so this, these are gouache drawings of uh, kind of these isolated headbangers in, in the in the void. And it was, I guess, it's one of the choreographies I could discern from heavy metal subculture. Something both at the I thought was interesting that the audience and the performers participated in, and it, it was it was actually like this interesting kind of physical call and response. And while I was doing that, I kind of had a lot of downtime. I had another, I had a, a son, and uh, I had a lot of uh, well, not much downtime, but I had this like time to kind of not sit around and make drawings and kind of do this other stuff and I had to find a way to make an image in another way. Um, so I started making these collages just with like Xerox machines and Xeroxes um, to try and like rep do like 
engage in like rep- repetition and replication and try and find these new openings with this with these forms that were coming out of it. And um, through that, I started thinking about Mercy um, Eliade, uh, it was this kind of uh, philosopher of religion. Um, he discusses that the confusion of imagery is a way of dealing with a reality that's like contradictory. Um, and in many ways, uh, the image exists because the concept can't be expressed. And to translate, uh, and actually, by the act of translating, you can mutate, annihilate, and annul this kind of sense of cognition. I thought that was really interesting uh, from him. So I, I kind of think that collage is a really kind of direct way to mutilate, kind of, and desecrate uh, your source, your image, um, and come up with something that's unique and your own in some way out of you know, something from your culture, from another subculture. I mean, that's pretty given, I guess. But uh, with, I was just trying to push the, uh, the source content into just being mirrors like of themselves or kind of disintegrating or morphing and mutating into something else. Um, and uh, in the end, you know, hopefully trying to like find uh, itself back to that source. Um, and these collages led me to a project that just got completed recently. So I think uh, May 7th, um, this project, um, it's titled uh, Dread Majesty. Um, and it's a cassette and newspaper. I've been doing this, I'm doing this series of um, newspaper publications with cassettes um, on this label called Accidental Guest out of uh, Washington, DC. And uh, this is the second one that we did. And I kind of had generated a lot of the work out of um, this veils body of work into this, which direct, tried to deal a little bit more directly with what the sublime would be. Um, and I was looking back to these like, really old ideas of the sublime, but kind of being confronted by something that's massive and kind of dwarfs you in some way. Um, so uh, this is the kind of fold of the newspaper and the cassette. Um, but these are some of the collages that um, inspired it, uh, just to reflect on what the sublime was. And I think, um, like Edmund Burke, this kind of very famous, like he wrote like on the philosophical inquiry into the sublime and the beautiful in the 19th century. He's like talking about how you know this kind of terror fuels your ideas of what beauty is and establishes what your idea of beauty is. Um, and then this, to me, it was this experience of like this obliteration, something that's anonymous again, like the profile Purdue, right? Um, that the face is removed, the face is excised in some way. Um, it's a part of something else. It's a lack or loss of identity in the, in the this kind of, you know, kind of glory of nature. Um, um, so I have a track, a sample track that comes from the cassette too. So the idea with the cassette was to um, try and make these two. They're short, like ten-minute compositions. So I have like a little two-minute sample of um, one of the tracks. Uh, it's titled "Up to the Threshold," which is actually what the sublime, the definition of the sublime uh, means is that up to the threshold. So.
So uh, that pleasant track led us into um, kind of the last thing I was going to talk about. But uh, uh, so that track was essentially established to like try and build up, I guess, like a sense of terror and the sublime. I think that's hopefully it was achieved. Um, and finally, the the last project that I felt engaged with. Uh, the profile Purdue, the Lost Profile, was actually kind of the most uh, ambitious and time-consuming for me because I, I, I was asked to be in this exhibition about um, Pier Paolo Pasolini um, by this gallery called Invisible Exports in New York, and um, I have I had been like saving all these stills from his films, and I didn't know quite know what to do with them, um, so I decided to make, um, and I. I quickly regretted suggesting it because it was a lot of work, but it was it was really worth it in the end to kind of investigate and really try and push myself um, through one to see if I was right to prove uh, that that Pasolini actually engaged in this uh, profile Purdue kind of using the back of the head throughout all of his films, and they got way more elaborate as he moved from something like Acetone to uh, something like Salo or something. Um, and I really, I, I had a hunch, I guess, because I knew like, oh, I know this film, I know the last film, you know, but I didn't know like every movie in the middle. So uh, I had to go and watch them all. Um, but I had been saving lots and lots of stills and, and trying to make these uh, dialogues. So in the end, um, I made uh, 16 publications, some with over 100 uh, images, um, all from each movie. Um, there's 12 movies, uh, but some of them were so many, there was like 140 in Teorema and um, just of all these shots he would use, the back of the head. So I tried to capture like every single one of them um, and put them all together. Uh, so again, kind of having this hunch. And I think it begins, like here's the Gospel according to St. Matthew, like it begins as this kind of Italian neorealism thing, like, oh, my camera's kind of wandering and I'm just kind of like capturing this or whatever and like people turned and my actors aren't professional actors or whatever, right? But then it becomes like this really like clear, like visual decision and language that he's using. Um, and then I think as he moves through, it becomes again like, um, you know, I, I think what I was trying to establish earlier that he really uses it effectively to establish this idea of like the erotic and um, kind of horror and power and these um, issues of gender. It's pretty amazing how he uses this thing that maybe was casual at first because it was part of like his style. And then, I mean, I might be reading into it because I've watched like every single one in a row and was capturing like every still. But I think that, um, you know, it was, it was pretty fascinating to me to see like how he would have all these, uh, this shot appear consistently. And, and um, you know, I think you know, one, you know, he was working with a lot of non-professional actors who were probably not as vain as uh, professional actors or something, but, you know, I think he was able to kind of get away with these kind of very casual shots and, um, and they really did help the story and kind of set you in this really believable position. Um, so whether it's Medea or, um, I'm trying to remember what the next one is. Yeah, so like the Decameron, which is just great, right? Um, so uh, again, there, there were, you know, uh, 16 of these and, and um, two volumes of the camera on again and the, the wonderful kind of uh, Canterbury Tales which had this amazing ending right um, and then uh, we get to things like A Thousand and One Nights and um, and my favorite was Sallow I think uh, it was uh, it's probably the film that kind of roped me into liking Pasolini but it was also like the film that he definitely used it more effectively it becomes like so much more alienating um, I think it, it kind of like solves a lot of problems for him, like uh, compositionally, but um, it's definitely like when we get to something like we have some of the shots, it's kind of hard to see here, but uh, for example, we also have the mirror, if you can see that on the right hand side there, like he, he also kind of, I'm sure is very astute uh, with the history of these shots and whatnot, um, and this kind of decision, this compositional decision. Um, so this was um, uh, the last kind of project I did to um, engage uh, the profile Purdue, the Lost Profile, and, um, and it was titled Lost Profiles, uh, actually the piece in the end, and it was a edition of, just a single edition, um, and in the end it was all kind of put together like that as the culmination of this investigation I did. Um, so in the end, um, I've been thinking about it for a while, and when uh, Sophia Jacob asked me to do something. Um, I was. I, I had all this content kind of floating around in my head, and these images I've been saving, and all this stuff. So it's nice to kind of get it out there in some way, because um, it's really fascinating. Um, and uh, I just found this one it was really great. But uh, um, uh, but I guess I don't, do we do questions now, or do we do them like we do them now? Yeah. 
So that was that's that's my that's my bit. Yeah. Sure. That was that was um, an interesting that, and I I almost went down this tunnel, a, t a, t a tangent of like that, and also like you know mirror fasting. There's like this really popular thing, maybe like four or five years ago, like high school students did. They like they wouldn't look in the mirror for like a week. Like not gonna look in the mirror. This like, it was like they blog about like how challenging it was to like not be so vain or something. Um, and I was like totally fascinated with that. Yeah, like this kind of like this denial of who you are, like this kind of the visage, right? Like this denial of. I thought I'm really, I am really interested in that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, it looks kind of weird because you have to like Photoshop your hand out or something. Yeah, that'd, be look, that'd also look kind of weird. But yeah, there's um, there, and there's a uh, plenty of other artists too. Like um, there's this great painter named Monica Majoli. I don't know if anybody know Monica Majoli. She's this really great painter, and she um, own, like she first started painting like the back of like uh, women's heads, and they're like really beautiful. And then she started doing these crazy watercolors of the back of like they're still like women's heads, but they're all like wearing like leather like bdsm masks and stuff but it's like the back of their head and it looks like it really really interesting um uh images and beautiful watercolors if you get a chance monica majoli i didn't have i don't know it wasn't like about that's another like tangent <laughs> you know like just trying to keep it somewhat direct but um but she does a really good job with some of those images sure So they began with like images I had saved of bands kind of performing and like I use a lot of like zines and because I love that like Xeroxy texture. Um, but then I started just using like high-end fashion magazines because you could cut them a little bit cleaner. <laughs> uh, um, the paper is like really nice. So they went up and, and I also got more interested in like, you know, I most of my work kind of dealt with like heavy metal and heavy metal subcultures and all this kind of like um, baggage that came with that. Um, and I wanted to try and like get further away from that and try and find some a different approach, a different avenue. And and um, it didn't have to, you know, you didn't really see it as like a fashion kind of element, but it was something that could be different or ch more challenging to to me, you know, to kind of deal with that um, and and make these new kind of maybe more abstract collages or something. Sure, thank you guys, thanks for listening. <laughs>